Would you like to take the reins? Would you like to take the reins? <sighs> you don't even look shell shocked. This is the one I'm doing first, right? Hello. Okay, let's get started. Uh, my name is Dong Min Luo. I'm with the California Air Resources Board Research Division. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce um, presenter Dr. Jim Kobe from University of Delaware. There will be two presentations. No, actually, it's two projects were under ARB's sponsorship and uh, just complete recently. And uh, the first presentation is evaluating the environmental attributes of freight traffic along the U.S. West Coast. And uh, the second presentation is input geospatial scenarios for commercial marine vessels. Thank you, Jim. Okay, 
Um, thank you very much. Good afternoon. And um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be back here again. Um, this, is, uh, this is the area that I was living in before I went back east. Um, Sacramento area and um, the Northern California Bay Area is where I grew up. So it's, it's a pleasure to be back and it's great to see um, friends and colleagues again. So um, thank you. Um, today we'll, I will be um, talking, is that going to work out okay? It sounds loud to me. Okay, good. Um, today I'll be talking about um, the two different projects that uh, ARB sponsored. Um, the first one being related to the geospatial intermodal freight transport model. That project is a, um, a large multi-year team project that is involving both the Rochester Institute of Technology and the University of Delaware. And it's part of a larger sustainable intermodal freight transport research program that's involving um, a number of, of um, participants um, in industry and, um, and colleagues in other universities as well. Um, and it has a, an international component. And so I'm real excited to talk about that, that project first. Um, in that project, um, uh, let me switch to project objectives. See if that's going to go here. Okay. So um, the, the, uh, this talk is going to parallel fairly closely the scope of work that was sponsored under, under ARB. And in that work, we had uh, project objectives to look specifically at the West Coast freight gateway and corridors, um, and then to look um, explicitly at port-related cargoes moving through um, the West Coast ports, primarily Southern California, two ports, um, and the port of Oakland. And then we, uh, we also looked a little bit north um, outside of California. Um, our work applied a geospatial uh, model to look at, uh, that, that, so that it would receive California-specific inputs, and then try to demonstrate what the potential for system-wide improvements could be. Um, this is sort of a thought experiment kind of analysis. Um, and uh, to try to look specifically at greenhouse gas reductions, although we also looked at some of the other emissions trade-offs from some of the, the more, uh, more obvious uh, changes that can occur, um, and, um, and then address goods movement. Today, what I'm going to do then is, again, following a little bit the, uh, the report that is available, um, do a little bit of very brief background on freight transport. I think what I've got is, um, is maximum of four slides. And knowing the people in this room, I'm going to go fairly quickly through that. Everybody here seems very well connected to goods movement. Um, so they'll be in the, uh, the, the downloadable slides for those that are on the web or other places. And then um, uh, talk about modeling alternatives, describe the gift model, um, outline specifically the methodology that this scope followed, and then talk about our results. And uh, summary and discussion will be available there. Um, for those in the room, if, if there are any questions, it's up to ARB, but I'm, uh, I know there'll be questions at the end. If there's clarifying questions along the way, I don't mind receiving them if it's um, helpful. And, and Dong Min, you can um, change that if for some reason on the web it doesn't work. Um, so very quickly, freight transport background, and uh, um, I don't know, I guess we don't have a train in here, but it's a, the freight system is a multimodal network, and it's a part of the larger transportation system. Um, and if, if transport in the United States represents about 35% of greenhouse gases, um, um, then, uh, you know, this is a, a sort of a six to two kind of number on gigatons. Um, it's, this is uh, not so much an eye chart here for this group, although a little bit of one. Um, you can kind of walk your way around and you see that the biggest chunk of the pie is light duty vehicles um, in terms of greenhouse gas footprint in the United States. But as you walk your way around, you can pick off um, many of the different freight modes. Um, and this, this is uh, from the, um, the AOE statistics, and so it also breaks out a little bit of the international, um, international shipping, et cetera. And then if we look at the freight sector in the United States, again, fairly large perspective, no surprise to the people here in the room, um, the uh, movements of goods that are independently routed along origins and destinations door-to-door, -door, trucking, 
moves both the largest fraction of the tons and the largest value of goods in the United States. Um, if we step back a little bit more um, to, uh, toward the, uh, the energy and greenhouse gas trade-offs on the left, the, you see in the, in the red um, gigaton kilometers per year in the blue and um, teragrams of CO2 per year in the red. And you can begin, this is a log scale on the y-axis, so uh, definitely pay attention to that. But the idea is that you can, you can begin at the macro level to divide those two and get an idea of energy intensity. And so you can see that while um, truck and rail moves similar volumes um, of, of payloads, you know, gigaton kilometers, um, the energy intensities change by an order of magnitude. And then on the right-hand side, there's an estimate of um, the U.S. in blue, the European picture in red, and a, a rough estimate with fairly wide uncertainty bars in yellow of, of sort of international all-inclusive. And um, that's, uh, that's all in gigaton kilometers moved. Um, the important thing about the freight sector is that it's very much coupled with the economics of uh, with GDP. Um, in fact, a rough a rough hand waving way to think of it is that if manufacturing and GDP are most are fairly very very closely coupled, and so the growth rate in GDP and the growth rate in manufacturing um, around the world are are often tightly coupled the freight sector tends to grow a little faster or respond a little bit more than the manufacturing sector. Whatever we make, we have to move. And when we move it more uh, discreetly to more points in separate packets of trucks or rail or less than truckload um, sized goods, then the energy intensity is at least as fast as the growth in what we make to deliver that and sometimes more. So now the, uh, the next thing I wanted to do is talk a little bit about um, modeling the possibilities and I want to describe the gift model specifically. The, um, the gift model is um, a, uh, a, a geographic interface for calculating routes that is a lot like um, Google Maps or some of the other routing software, routing software that, that we're used to. Um, and we um, started working on that when we started seeing how the freight analysis framework was being very descriptive and we wanted to see what would happen if we changed what we saw to some other set of routing rules um, or took advantage of what we saw and started calculating some of the energy and environmental impacts. So, um, um, so that's the, 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 what the GIFT model is and does. There's more description in the report. The idea is that it's a tool that we wanted to make uh, uh, to bring in a collaborative environment so that decision makers could begin to explore the trade-offs. Um, there's a lot of ways to do benchmarking and a lot of the freight data tools that were first out over the early 2000s were mostly benchmarking. They, saw, they benchmarked what we saw. And, um, and so once you benchmark, that's nice because you can think about how to step off the bench. But if your target is a lot further than just getting off the bench, then you need to start to visualize where you can get to. And so this allows us to visualize some pretty radical changes um, prior to the timeline for evaluating infrastructure investment, fleet turnover, other sorts of things. Um, here, uh, just as a description, the blue, the purpley line um, is, is one of the lines you, we got when we ran the least cost scenario. Um, but the uh, the reds and the blues will be the or the reds and the greens will be the more the focus for today, which are the the um, the least time in red and the least CO2 in green. The way that we're using GIFT and we apply it in this context a little bit in the uh, the ARB project is we're looking for ways to get the leaders in the transportation sector to stand together and look at what would happen if they collaboratively, rather than independently or, collect or, or, or competitively, uh, tried to figure out what would work best. And that's important because of the various dimensions in which we can achieve improvements in both greenhouse gases and in environmental performance and still meet the economic requirements of on-time delivery, reliability, and cost. Um, 
And so some of the uh, six of the dimensions are listed here, um, including infrastructure, different kinds of fuels, technologies, changing the way that operat operations work, changing logistics, which is uh, uh, origin destination networks, and, um, and then perhaps even demand. Um, so the way that the GIFT model is built, and here I think I have uh, three slides, fairly detailed um, and somewhat standard if, uh, if you've seen, any, uh, seen the report or any of the other papers, um, is a little bit about how it's put together. Um, there is a road, road network for North America and indeed for other countries. There's a rail network and, um, and there's a waterway network. And what we did is we joined them all together, not just visually, but interactively through a hub and spoke network. And um, that allowed us to then associate data sets of attributes related to the segments and related to the virtual links that made up the nodes. And, um, and then that allows us to then, when we solve a route, accumulate counts across each of those attributes. So the, uh, the model, when it's all densely put together, looks like this big, um, crazy map, and, um, and one of the solved routes that we did early on in the Great Lakes is shown in the bottom right. Um, and what you see is in the um, bar charts across the top one, you see carbon dioxide and the bottom one is time, and we immediately then are showing you for the same, um, same ship or rail or truck, truck is on the left, rail is sort of in the middle of the last three. Um, you can see what the CO2 footprint looks like for each of those routes by truck, by rail, or by ship, and then what the time would look like. So you can see that the least time route in the bottom graph is the truck, um, but the least CO2 route is um, sort of a specialized vessel that we looked at. I think that second one is an uh, integrated tug barge system that would move fairly slowly, and it has the largest time penalty because it is a slow barge and tug, a towboat. So this is the kind of uh, differences we can begin to look at, and that way we can help look for sweet spots or areas where either infrastructure differences or, um, or, or other sorts of things can, can um, improve. One of the other things that, that's embedded in GIFT, and we used it in the work here, but we've also recently developed this on, in, as its own uh, abstract, not geospatial calculator is a three-mode emissions calculator. Um, and uh, in, that, in that calculation, we can go in and specify uh, fuel type properties, energy densities, physical densities. We can specify technology properties. We can specify fuel economy, um, speeds, different things like that. And we can specify operations, freight sorts of commodity, uh, properties like the numbers of TEUs in that vehicle um, or the weight of each of those, vehicle, those TEUs, the, the, the payload weights. And so by entering in a variety of these things for different modes, we can then uh, populate a suite of different kinds of unique vessels, vehicles, or vessels, trucks, or locomotives, all of which are vehicles in the model. Um, and, um, and then, then um, identify those. Now, the, the calculator is nice because there's a lot of folks out there who look at the different calculators that are on the web. Um, the rail companies have a, have a calculator that almost always makes rail look good, and the trucking folks have a calculator that makes trucks look not so much worse than, than um, uh, NPR suggests rail can be, and various things like that. Well, this is one that's transparent, and you can put in the kind of detail you want and then you can understand what happens if you change some of that. So now back to the, to the specifics of the project. Our research methodology was to um, adopt uh, uh, the GIFT analytic structure and adapt it for, um, for the California-specific data. And so here we have, a, in, in the columns, you see we've got freight transportation data, uh, different scenario and configuration data, um, and then um, we have some, some results, and then we evaluate and compare those scenarios in an analysis, sort of a post-solve analysis, which is part of the work. Um, the freight data, we, did, we spent uh, our first part of this project looking through all the available freight data that we could find, um, or that ARB and uh, Caltrans could push 
toward us. And then um, we evaluated whether it was ready, whether it was geospatial in nature, whether it had adaptability or transformation potential. Um, uh, I would uh, like to perhaps point out, especially for those that may look at this report after the seminar, that none of those conclusions are final in the sense that more, those data are all evolving and they've, they've changed a fair amount even since we did that work. And the, the, maybe the idea that we decided something wasn't quite ready for GIFT had a lot more to do with the schedule of the project and the pace of the project than its ultimate uh, inability to be adapted. So there, the, the model, the GIFT model is designed to be uh, um, multi-scale, problem focused, and data plural. And uh, we think that, that that's still the case. We did lock down from the freight data analysis in our early tasks on the kinds of data that were going to be most available for the, the parts of the analysis that were most important to ARB. And then we developed scenarios, and the scenarios were mostly related to the port goods movement scenarios using the most available data we had. And uh, uh, partway through the project, we were able to uh, receive from ARB some additional, um, especially, I guess it was partly, partly modified FAF data that um, uh, California was able to, to ask us to use, and when we looked at that, it turned out that that data was as good um, for, uh, as other data that we had, and it was a better fit because ARB staff already had, had processed how that data was analyzed, so we were able to use that. So in the gathering of data, I guess I'm jumping a little ahead, here's the slide on that. We started with the commodity flow survey, I think we started with 2002, but we updated to 2007 as that data uh, became more, more uh, readily available. We had uh, information on port generated traffic, which was the goods moved through the ports. That came from the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, there is, um, um, and then we had the, the Cambridge Systematics origin destination database, which was, was provided. Um, we looked at the routes um, and, and de developed a multi-origin, multi-destination, an OD pair um, set. I think nationally, I think we're the, the, the commodity flow survey, the Cambridge Systematics modified data sorts of opportunities, they give us something around 500, maybe it's a little more than 500 origin destination pairs. I don't remember the exact number. And here we looked at um, inbound versus outbound goods through the ports, which was uh, from the Army Corps data and we're able to, uh, to match that together. Um, and that was then uh, mapped on these nodes which made up the origins and the destinations. And so, um, so one of the things that we did analytically um, in this project was look at different ways in which we could then allocate flows. And we had um, uh, tonnage data from the metropolitan statistical area or the, the consolidated statistical area levels. We had uh, county level populations. We could assume that goods were moving where people were. Um, and uh, we could um, incorporate city populations and go lower. Um, and uh, again, the, the Cambridge, the, the commodity flow data that was already somewhat allocated and massaged by mode, et cetera, in the, um, the Cambridge data was what we ended up using. And then uh, I already talked a little bit about the emissions calculator, so I won't spend much time here. But um, the eye chart on the right shows you specifically some of the assumptions. But uh, these were the generic, uh, these were the average, the fleet-wide average numbers that we used for CO2 emissions in grams per TEU mile um, for uh, each of the segments. So every time there was a, tr a mile of truck road that the trucks were traveling on, they got the 830 number. And then when there was a transfer from one mode to the other, there was uh, the, the spoke calculations, and they showed up in a grams per TEU basis because there's, no zero, there's zero miles moved. It's just a lift or an unlift or a transfer or a reload, but there's energy and emissions associated with that. Um, we also did other pollutants, as uh, you see in the report, but the, uh, this presentation I'm showing you mostly the CO2 numbers. Um, again, those data are all modifiable um, the part of the work that the model wasn't quite ready to do, and I don't think the data was quite ready to do, is to assign a different type of truck to different origin destination pairs. But you can envision capturing a set of OD pairs that are dreyage type and using dreyage average properties, or that are corridor specific and using corridor specific properties. 
um, uh, just uh, by way of more detail, recently a, uh, uh, a non-governmental organization working with ocean-going shipping took data from, I think, 19 or so different shippers. They had uh, something in the order of 2,000 data points for different vessels. And they looked at the origins and destinations, the corridors, the, the main routes, so Asia to the West Coast kind of a route corridor. And they calculated uh, route-specific, corridor-specific um, emissions. And you could then imagine putting those, associating those with, with those sorts of origins and destinations and bringing that into the international portion of the shipping gift model. The same kind of idea could be done with, with uh, trucking corridors or rail corridors. So here's some of the maps that came out of the results. Um, and this is hardly readable, so I apologize. Um, the, the, the backlight's only so good there. I, I'll have to figure out a, a way to be able to, sh to uh, show comparative things um, in a little bit bigger size. I probably could have zoomed in. And uh, so that's my third round on the apology on this one. Um, but on the left, you see the data that was coming into the West Coast. Um, you can see stronger lines, and the data that's coming to the ports on the West Coast, you can see weaker lines. And that's essentially a representation of the um, import-export ratios. So, um, so you can at least explain why those look so different. Now, if we switch, and I'm going to kind of switch back and forth, if you kind of see the differences here, and you can see that mostly on the left, um, and this is least time. This is uh, the algorithm that we used here was to have uh, the fastest routes in this one. And then this was the least CO2 routes. And so you can see a little difference in the routes, small change in the squiggles. And you can see a difference in the intensities, although I wouldn't challenge you to try to quantify that. That's done mostly in the, in the tables in the, in the report. Um, one way to think about that, and, and we did this um, by air basin for a couple of reasons. One was because we were also looking at some of the criteria pollutants. Um, but here you can see um, in the least time routing which of the air basins had the most intensity. And again, I challenge you to read the legend, um, and I apologize for, the, for the, 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 the size of that. But on the right-hand side, you see that the low CO2 intensities using the same scale um, shows a lower CO2 footprint across most all air basins. It wasn't exactly all air basins. This is now a differencing where we took the, the least time minus the, the least CO2 and getting the difference there. Um, there are air basins that have an increase. The, the, uh, the yellow regions are an increase in CO2 emissions, and that's partly because the rail corridors go through those and the highway corridors move um, to other ones. Um, in the report, we have a table, and this is an eye chart that I'll give you the uh, color code to. Um, but we, we do look at the differences by corridor. There's a green at the top, which is South Coast and San Joaquin Valley. And in that, you see that the percent change, it's the far right column, is in the 60% range in terms of reduction in CO2 when we switch from a, a, a least time algorithm, which is um, uh, mostly trucking, to a least CO2 um, root solve algorithm. San Diego County shows about a 86% reduction. And the South Central and North Central coasts um, showed modest increases. One was almost a doubling, but a doubling of a number that wasn't as big, if you look at the other columns, as the reductions. So statewide, it's a net reduction. Now this is partly important because some of these mode shifts are associated with a change in the combustion properties or the degree of emissions control for the other modes. And so um, I, I live currently in um, uh, an East Coast city in Delaware that uh, has a freeway about six miles outside of town, but a freight rail line that goes right through the middle. And if you do make those mode shifts and you um, get, uh, achieve these wonderful CO2 trade-offs, uh, they can be associated with an increase in exposure for other criteria pollutants, for example, particulate matter. Yes?
Well, so the mode shift in the, the, the yeah. Yeah, so, so the question is that in the, in the San Diego example, where there's an 86% change, what would be the mode shift? And I'll first tell you exactly what I know, and then I'll tell you what I think, and then I will promise to check it. Um, I know that the difference in the, the routing through San Diego County was a least time routing, so the fastest routes according to using uh, posted speeds and um, uh, characteristics of trucking versus rail. So, so uh, that was least time routing. And then the second comparative algorithm was uh, least CO2 routing, which would have chosen lower CO2 routes wherever they would be available. And that typically, for all of the, the results across this study, was a, a, a sort of a uniform switch to maximize use of rail. Okay, so no, there was no there was no situation in our current case studies, but partly because we had one default vessel in the in the mix, and that vessel was designed to be capable of ocean going. Um, it had to be seaworthy enough to be able to. So we used something that that's modeled after a, about a I think it's a 2000 TEU <coughs> coastwise container vessel that's. Um, used in Europe and has been in a number of short sea studies. That vessel did not do um, uniformly better, um, especially when you counted mode shifts and all those other sorts of things, than train. So having said that, the 2010 NTAD data, which we've upgraded GIFT to um, this year, um, but after this analysis, came along with explicit detail, some detail about grade, which we talked about earlier with Todd, but also detail about which rail segments were active and which rail segments were not active. Um, it could be, and I'd have to go look, that in the San Diego area there's some rail lines that were chosen in this least CO2 algorithm, and I think that that would be the case. It's also possible that if you know that area better, that you know that those rail lines um, are turned off, and that would be, I would say, a correction that this gift could make. But all in all, we made no capacity limit assumptions for any of the routes. So if there's an active rail line and you think that it doesn't have the capacity, it would have been selected in this case study under these parameters for San Diego. Does any of this underlying network you use in like NTAC train capacity attributes? Or when you say it's data blind to that because you don't have access to any data to train it, do you? In this, in this application and for this report, we were data blind to capacity issues. In, um, in our current summer work, we're beginning to look at, not, not directly at capacity issues, but directly starting to get toward it. We're beginning to look at grade and look at ways to adjust speed with grade, for especially for rail. Um, looking for ways to make sure that the least time route doesn't assume that you're always going at posted speed limits. Um, we did a, another study simultaneous to this where we looked at the elements of the speed changes, et cetera. Again, neither of those are capacity constrained. Um, I, would, I would say that for most of the examples we've looked at, the capacity constraints are ambiguous. But in San Diego, it sounds like there may be some um, clear capacity constraints. We do vehicle weight limit. We make sure that we're doing different things. So we're, we're ca catching those sorts of, of no-go capacity barriers. Go ahead with your other question. Sorry for the long answer. Right. No, one of the one of the bounding one of the bounding limits for this scenario analysis was to maintain the same flows through the same ports. In fact, it's the same year's data that we're using. So we're not looking at a shift in origins and destinations that may occur from Vietnam to South America or any. Or we're not looking. At, I'll talk to you in the Q and A if you want to ask me about some work we're doing now, which is really an economic random utility study of the expanded Panama Canal and what the potential diversions could look like. But we, there we're beginning with an economic study and then we'll associate um, other sorts of flows with that. And then after we do that, then we'll associate the environmental trade-offs. So um, I think I'm, I'm forgetting to repeat the question. You can also remind me or you can start doing that. But uh, let me see. I can probably finish up more quickly as well. Um, and we'll make sure I repeat the next questions. Um, 
I apologize to the webinar folks. Um, so, so some comparisons, and here I show you three tables. The only one I'm going to talk about while you look at, at the tables you want in the slides is the bottom one, where the least time scenario had uh, CO2 emissions of uh, almost 3 million metric tons, and um, the least uh, CO2 scenario chopped that down by more than, more than half. Uh, they're about 40% of their original emissions if you got a statewide Let's see, this is, this is total emissions, I believe, as well. This is across the whole origin destination pair. So remember, we had these 500 or so origin de destination pairs that we were routing um, our, our cargoes on. If the cargo goes to Colorado or if the cargo goes to New York, these are reductions across that whole length. Um, we also report, and I don't think I have it in my slides, um, what the in-state portion of those changes would be. Um, but um, um, but this, this reports what the sort of uh, uh, system benefits would be from, from that kind of a shift. Um, and that presumes, of course, um, that once the um, cargo leaves on, say, a low CO2 algorithm, leaves the boundaries of California, it doesn't pull over and quickly shift to a truck or something else, which doesn't seem economic. So, but that, that's, a, that's a transparent assumption that may or may not occur for all goods movements. Okay, so, um, so now let me go over two slides that summarize the conclusions in the report and then open it up for legitimate questions or, for, I mean, complete, complete, uh, complete questions in which they'll be mic'd so that uh, I won't have to remember to repeat them. I didn't mean the word legitimate, that, but I mean the, the, the Q&A where I don't have to, to be the one that makes the mistake to not, not, be, uh, not, not let the question be heard. Um, so, um, when we did this analysis, and I would think of this as a bounding analysis that allows the freight movement folks here in the state to begin to think about what the potential is from at least one big measure, which is a, a wholesale mode shift, that um, CO2 routing, uh, using the CO2 routing constraints, illustrates that there can be significant benefits from a mode shift. Um, the total reductions are shown and counted. And um, it turns out to be that, uh, a fairly large fraction, if you count the whole network's benefits of the stated goals of the, I forget the, the scoping goal number, but, um, um, and the, the results are based, are limited to port-related goods movement, and they are, uh, they assume that those uh, movements are currently occurring dominantly through trucks, um, and so, in other words, we didn't do, uh, we didn't, the, the, the combination of the port-related flow data from the Army Corps and the Cambridge systematic data for all goods from a, a metropolitan statistical area um, could not be perfectly reconciled. And so we made an assumption that mostly the rail was handling bulk or semi-bulk goods directly out of the rail yard. And, um, and so, that, so this is sort of a bounding analysis, best case and worst case, if you will. Um, and um, we think that the, that the results are useful in beginning to think about that. Um, one of the things that the, the results are useful to think about is then if you think about, well, let's, let's not hold a strict assumption of mode switching, but let's see, think about if we can improve the fuel economy of the truck vehicles or if we can electrify something. You can start to calculate the fractions of those vehicles that would have to switch and the targets that they, their technologies or fuels or operations would have to meet in order to approximate a fraction or a large fraction or a substitution for the results here. So it gives you, um, the mode switching is sort of the easiest first thing to look at and it gives you an idea of the space in between to look for other options. Um, and, um, and then lastly, we were able to prove that the GIFT model at least can be used for these kinds of system levels analysis um, and, um, and this is a lesson that's, that's appropriate for a number of different models that are also geospatial that are also looking at goods movement. Um, and the, uh, the model parameters can be adjusted, um, not just adjusted um, by a user hypothetically thinking about a, a vehicle, but, but adjusted with a systematic review for data that's um, at least state level the best available at the time we ran the, the study. So we can make those kinds of adjustments. Um, and uh, we have some future improvements that are listed here in the smaller text. 
Um, we did look at a single criteria, least time versus least CO2. You can begin to build in some other sorts of uh, combinations, multi-criteria constraints. We're doing that a little bit now by beginning to improve the economic data that's in the default, uh, the, the defaults in the, in the model. Specifically, we're working very closely with one of my students now and um, looking at freight rate information um, and looking at the kinds of fees that occur when you go through the canal and the kinds of other sorts of intermodal costs that would occur to have uh, something go by rail all the way, say, to Memphis. And then comparing those, those alternate routes in a West Coast versus East Coast sort of economic kind of study. Um, then, then we'll be able to look at the in environmental performance differences. We did uh, play with, in this model, um, a data set, a proprietary data set on posted speeds, empirical speeds. And um, that data wasn't complete enough and a good enough match to all the origin destination pairs for us to look at it. And it was similar enough that for the kinds of insights we needed to do, we used it. But we could look at doing that a little more. And there's a lot, new, a lot of new tools coming online that gives us in empirical speeds. Um, geospatial gradient data, ups and down the hills, and um, different emissions calculations. There's, there's new, new emissions calculator models. We can look at uh, model year mixes and get fleet average sorts of things by corridor, that kind of thing, as I mentioned. And, um, and then a, a, a report we did, a uh, study we did simultaneous or in parallel with this one for um, a federal funding was to look at the kinds of delays. Um, in this work, we did not have um, the kinds of terminal delays that are in the rail system. So, um, and we did not, uh, I think in this one, we did not specifically adjust for single driver rest periods. Um, so the, the time, the least time routing which is consistently the trucking, even when you add those things in, if we were to show numbers that show the difference in the hours, they, they're adjustable quite a bit as you start to think about ways to use labor and, and timing to uh, minimize those differences, either for an alternate to uh, trucking or within the trucking mode. And with that, I will take a breath and, um, and allow the questions to be mic'd this time. Well, uh, I have a couple of questions, uh, several questions actually, on the emissions assumptions that's led. Uh, I noticed for truck and rail, uh, they have efficiency 42%, but the ship is just 40%. What's the reason? Is that because of the fuel? No. Um, I think that what we're doing there is reporting what was in the model when we ran it. Um, I think that the, uh, the engine efficiencies of 42% probably are too high for truck, as I look at that. And, um, but you know, the idea that the engine efficiencies for diesels are in the 30s to 40% is more, more the thing. So um, I think we're reporting here. I know that uh, the, the team member that performed this, that prepared this slide, it was, was likely reading this off of the inputs. So um, uh, I don't have a, a, a good defense for that. I would change those numbers, I think. Okay. Uh, for the truck, uh, miles per gallon is six here. So yep. I'm wondering if your haul is included or not, or just for the highway, heavy duty, diesel duty vehicles. Finish the question. Say that question again. I didn't hear the last I mean, uh, for the truck, only highway, heavy duty diesel vehicles included there, or general U-Hauls are also included. U-Hauls? You, you know, for, uh, for home moving, something like that. He's asking about just the way that the, he would be looking only at heavy, heavy duty trucks, or we were looking at heavy duty trucks in general, which would include more weight classes? Right. And we were looking at statistics for heavy duty trucks in general, but class eight heavy duty trucks, not, uh, not, not small, uh, courier trucks or, or things like that. So mostly heavy duty trucks. And when you look at the heavy duty truck statistics, the national level across most all years, um, a six mile per gallon plus or minus maybe half a mile per gallon is a fleet wide average. Um, you know, we, we've heard anecdotally of places, I think in the I-40 corridor where some company claims that they've got an 11 mile per gallon 
truck fleet, and I'd really like to see that. But but uh, that's the number we put in, and we put it in uniform for all all of the truck moves. All the truck moves also made the assumption that each truck was carrying two 20-foot equivalent units, so two TEUs or one 40-foot box. So in terms of the idea of a U-Haul or or a, or a 53-footer or some of the other things that are more um, obviously seen when you get stuck behind trucks along the roads. We sort of, uh, currently what we do is we explicitly say this is for intermodal and the, the standard intermodal unit is a TEU. Um, we, uh, we can make adjustments for an OD pair to rename or re-specify re what is in a TEU so that it looks more like a 53 unit, but we don't have a 53 unit item to select in the model at this point. That can, be, that can be added as a sort of another vehicle type. Okay. Uh, what does TEU stand for? 20 foot equivalent unit. So basically, if, um, if you look at a box that would be intermodal, which means you could lift that box off a chassis onto a train, off that train onto a ship, um, that box is about eight feet wide, about eight feet high, and 20 feet long. And it, um, it can be loaded up with, um, two small television sets or a hole packed in with feathers or it can be loaded up with uh, heavy, heavier things, cereal or other sorts of things, up until it meets a limit that when it's combined with another 20-foot box onto a truck, for example, mostly this is the truck limit, then, then that payload plus the several thousand pounds of box plus the chassis and the, the truck adds up to is it 80 or 84,000, 80,000 gross vehicle weight tons. And that's where um, an intermodal, most intermodal movements in North America um, have a weight limit associated with the on-road portion of the intermodal. Um, so for example, um, you could take that same 20-foot unit and you could put it onto a rail and you could probably load it up um, for more, I think we have in here, is it seven tons per TEU is our assumption? I think it's in here. Should be in here. No, it says 10. We had 10 tons per TEU in the case study. And seven's a more reasonable average for the data we've seen, but we, we made everything 10 here. And 10 is about the max you can put into uh, two boxes on a truck and still pass the 80,000 limit, give or take a little. Okay, uh, my last question is about mode choice. Uh, you know, for truck and rail between two cities, there could be Sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, all right, uh, between between two cities like you know O and D, uh, maybe truck and rail could be available both. Right. So, what kind of mode choice approach you there? Is that low so model or no no low no This low case is most this this set of scenarios we ran are mostly idealized. So, uh, if there was an origin destination pair that was um, a thousand miles between the origin and the destination. Then, and we gave it the least time algorithm, it would choose all the segments that would um, add up to a, a time of delivery, a time of transit, including any of the nodes. It would add up to a time less than if it chose anything else. So mostly it chose all truck, and it mostly avoided nodes where it would shift cargo from one truck to another. Um, with the um, least CO2, it would not always have a rail segment all the way from the origin to the destination. So there would be a truck segment to a rail node, a node that was capable of rail and truck transfers. And there would be a calculation of the energy and time in that transfer. And then there would be a movement along that rail segment. And then again, if it needed to get off rail to meet the destination location, then it would do that. In that kind of a case, the, um, let me go back and make sure I, there was a part of your question I wanted to hit hard at the end here. Um, the, um, sorry, repeat the last part of your, your, your question again because I want to make sure I, I hit it. All right. So, uh, y you know, um, for mode choice between several different modes, uh, logic model is very uh, right. popular. So. Is the logic model used here or no, not? No, it's not used here. So this is using a least CO2 algorithm, a single attribute maximizing or minimizing that attribute. 
when you minimize that attribute, one of, a couple of things happen, and, um, and they would uh, bear uh, some additional analysis, but they'd be easily identifiable in the results here. One of the things is that just because there's a rail link between an origin and a destination doesn't mean it's economic even to use that rail link if it's less than uh, about 250 miles. Um, there's, no, there's a sort of a sweet spot between about 150 and 300 miles distance where the economics of truck and rail begin to, to, um, to play a little bit such that you see more, I mean, trucks, mo rail is mostly used for long haul. So if, there, if we were to apply a, um, a set of reallocation algorithms, we'd be uh, attaching some of the, um, the logit modeling kind of logic, that kind of stuff. And my colleague, James Weinbrake, who I think looking at the time, is, think is, is also on the webinar a little bit. But he's, he's um, our, our multi-criteria modeling expert for those sorts of things. He's, um, he's very familiar with, with how those work, and he would be leading that part. And so I'm the spokesman in that, in that case. But this, this scenario did not use anything other than a strict minimization of two very idealized routing algorithms. OK, so it's not based on probability distribution. No, in fact, in fact, all we did was solve the OD pairs with these algorithms. We then made the assumption that the flow of goods would look the same either way. So we used the Cambridge Systematics um, freight analysis framework origin destination flows, and we flowed a million tons or a million units of cargo between this origin and this destination across either this route or, or the other route. Um, but we didn't make any assumption about the changes in flows. And in fact, if you were to begin a probability analysis like that, um, you'd be either confounded by or, or, or begin to want to think about what would happen under those algorithms in terms of the elasticity of diversion of those cargos to other places that would be similarly able to ultimately meet um, fi find a profitable point of sale or, or consumption. But that's, that's a really good question. Uh, when the full report will be available? I don't, I don't know. I can give it to you today. It was delivered in March. It's posted. Will you include in the future model improvements uh, traffic congestion factors to account for delay in the network? Um, I'm interested in doing more delay work. Um, I'm very interested in that personally, um, and the team is interested in that because of the, the really interesting insights that we came up with from the uh, related project that the, the Department of Transportation funded. Let me just um, let me resist going to another presentation that I'm making later in the week, but let me just see if I can give you some idea of the kinds of elements of delay that are in the system, and then wrap back around to the idea of congestion. Um, let me begin with, by touch, by, let me first begin with the idea of congestion and then end with it. One of the neatest uh, studies that, that we began looking at when we looked at the, con the, the delay system uh, thing is a, is a Cambridge Systematics report that looked at bottlenecks. And the bottlenecks related to um, congestion at various points where there are um, daily peaks of, of traffic, mostly non-truck traffic. And there are delays that you can calculate at those, those points. And uh, the Cambridge Systematics analysis did a really nice, very transparent, easily followed study that um, attributed those average, those daily average delays um, to trucks as if they would um, impact those congested times with the same frequency as any other time of the day. And uh, they calculated how many hours of delay and then priced it. And they, they, they do some neat stuff. So, we looked at that, and that was part of our starting point when we did the delay project, which is, which is outside of this, this work explicitly. When we did that, we turned to the multimodal sources of delay, and we came up with uh, what I call a taxonomy of delay. I don't know if I'll remember all. I think there's five of those. I don't know if I remember them all. But congestion's only one source of delay in the network. There are mode shifts that are sources of delay. Um, and, um, and uh, those, are, those are transfers, and uh, I'm remembering that one. This is out of order. Really, the, the very first source of delay in the system is the route selection. So if I choose to move things from Sacramento to Napa, 
it takes less time, there's less delay than if I move it from, from Sacramento to Memphis, route selection. So where do I put my factory? Where do I put my distribution center? Where do I put the origins for my goods movement? That affects the time of delivery more than anything else. And of course, those are all things that everybody here in the room sort of throwing their eyebrows saying, well, yeah, but those are all givens, but they aren't givens in the marketplace. They do move over time and they matter. So if you, ch if you give a fuel price signal over the next 20 years, it's three times or four times today's price signal, you will see distribution centers move. Maybe they'll replicate and there'll be more of them. Maybe there'll be fewer of them. Maybe they'll be in different places, but factories will move, markets will move. That's what happens. Um, when energy prices were cheap, everybody lived in Stockton or, or whatever and commuted into the Bay Area, and now people are moving back. And so things change over the long term. We typically hold those as given, and I get that. But that was the biggest source of how long it was going to take. Almost anything else you did could only tweak that once you decided your origin and destination. Second one was, um, um, well, one of the second ones was uh, what we call dwell time which is time when freight's not moving. Now the easiest, the reason we use the word dwell is because the easiest place to find that was in rail. Um, in big rail yards, there's a rail performance metric that shows that the biggest rail yards in the United States have between 24 and 36 hours of dwell time, periods of time when the cargo is not actively transferring, but waiting to be actively transferred and then departed and dispatched. Um, there's dwell time um, in the trucking industry, if you've ever seen an unmanned freight yard or a place where trucks unhook a chassis and then go home and 12 or 14 hours later another truck picks up that chassis and moves on, that's dwell. That time mattered more than congestion. The other one is if you have uh, labor derived delays. Now ships are kind of easy because you put three shifts on them and your ship tries to run all the time with three crews. Rail is also better but there are some uh, labor limits regulated, some ma mandates for rest periods in, in uh, rail crews. The easiest one to see is that there's um, a single driver re mandated rest period, a motor vehicle carrier rule. And so there's delay in the system because what we call labor derived delays. Um, and you can compensate for that by paying for double labor so that you don't have to have a rest period and let the person sleep in the sleeper car and your hot bunk. Um, but anyway, when, you, when we looked across all of the sources of delay that we looked at, congestion delay at the intersections, while meaningful, and probably very important for, for passenger transit, um, was not as large as these other systematic things which could be benefited from infrastructure. And uh, the reason I made you such a long answer, sir, is because I think that if you're going to look at changing um, a freight network for goods movement so that you can achieve emissions or greenhouse gas targets, you have a lot of opportunity to mitigate the delay in dwell, in um, in some of the route selection sorts of things, you can work with the various long-term planners in industry and other parts and maybe maybe um, see some synergies there. You know, doing things to get an HOV lane through a, through a bypass should be one of the things to look at as well. And it may be a much less expensive, easy way to get 10 or 12 minutes of delay time out of a route. You went uh, actually right where I wanted to ask you to go. Good. Um, from an A or B perspective, we are just starting to look at a freight system of the future and thinking about all those factors that are important. And certainly the industry surveys that I've seen for the shippers and the cargo owners say that the reliability is the top most important quality, velocity and price follow after that. What tools would you recommend that we go explore that exist or that we develop to be able to more accurately quantify the the, both the speed, the velocity, and the reliability. When we look at mode shifts, when we look at potentially goods coming into different ports, when we look at domestic goods, I mean, we're really going to look at the whole universe of freight. What else do we need that's not in our, our toolbox right now? That's a really, really important question, and um, I'm going to do my best to avoid sort of the, well, you need this tool answer, because um, this, I think, is one of the kinds of of frameworks in which you can begin to um, attach tools, test out ideas. But I want to start with um, um, sort of a, a smile and, a, and, a, and an agreement that reliability is, from what I can see, the most important 
uh, aspect of freight performance that's probably non-negotiable. And what's really in, in interesting when I go around and listen is that a lot of people put time, speed of delivery um, there. And I think that speed of delivery has become, over the last 35 or years, maybe longer, maybe the last 100 years, the speed of delivery has been the biggest hedge to ensure reliability. If it's fast and it gets delayed, you know, I have a 10-hour trip and it's delayed 10%, that's one hour delay. I can handle that. But if I go by a slow boat and it's a three-day trip and there's a 10% delay, then that's maybe an unacceptable delay. So I think the reliability is the key and I want to make sure that that's, that's something I, I hear and so far I haven't heard anything that would uh, uh, require us to bump that to second or third. So I agree with you there. Speed of delivery, frequency are all enablers of reliability and they usually are in the top three but since I think of them as enablers for reliability. So first of all, great question. Um, I think that the, m I, I think you're asking for me to try to come up with a unique answer rather than, well, here's the list of tools that everybody knows and we all need to use these tools and these are my favorite five and gifts at the top or something. What I think I want to make sure that I, I, I sort of express is that the biggest challenge for the future freight system is that there is an asymmetry in the decision authority. That's the key thing to think about when you decide how to bring tools and people together. There are a group of people that think about how to change pavement and bridges and structures, rail lines for the next 25 or 30 years, and they think decadally. And everybody else takes their thinking as a given, and they begin to think given whatever they see. And then uh, you have a, a fleet operations folks and ARB and folks that you guys are looking at changing performance over five, ten years, maybe, maybe, maybe faster, maybe a little less, by trying to affect fleets and turnover and usage and, and that kind of thing. But the, the shippers and some of the carriers, they think about the next day's dispatch. So you have a daily, uh, some multi-year sort of size and decadal, and I, the biggest tool that I think is needed is to create a collaborative environment for creative play, and I, I don't know how many times the word play gets used in seminars, but um, so that the people thinking decadally can think about something differently than they would have otherwise, and so without trying to use the name of this model, I think a virtual environment that allows for what ifing across technology, operations, fuels, and infrastructure is the kind of collaborative tool that will um, generate reinforcement of good ideas people in the room already have and disseminate those to people who are skeptical that they can survive in that future. And okay. one more thing, just to, for you special, what's your name? Cynthia Marvin with ARB. Well, Cynthia, um, the other thing is I think you would like a book called The Horse in the City. It's a history of the urban horse. And um, I read that book to try to remember to play because there was a group of people that in the 1900s, just about, just about 1911, just about 100 years ago, were really, really worried about the overwhelming manure problem, the congestion in the cities, the um, problems with fuel quality, which was called horse feed, and, um, and in fact with how um, people were maintaining their, their engines, their horsepower. Um, the rise of something called the Association, the American Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals came about because, not because people like me give really long answers to Cynthia and beat a dead horse, but because people were really beating horses to death trying to get a day's work out of an underfed horse. Um, that was the way they saw the world back then. And I would have loved to have seen them get a multimodal, multi-infrastructure -infra model that um, would let them see that the Teamsters would still survive a century later, but they wouldn't be driving teams of horses, that they would be better off than they were before, and that they survived a rail spine that they opposed almost unilaterally. Um, so uh, th th the main thing is collaborative play is gonna be the, the biggest tool and figuring out different ways to make that work analytically so that it feeds back self-consistent information to the, to the um, teams at ARB who need to understand just the numbers and the physics and the dollar signs, that's going to be the key tool. Just a quick follow-up to that. 
Um, you mentioned that the gift model that you developed or the application you developed for us didn't include this federal add-on for delays in the network. So right. does, does the current model that you've customized for California let you or let us look at delays? Today's model has it in there. We, we turn it on, we turn it off. Um, I, would, I would tell you for sure that Doug, Todd, and three other people in the room that I probably can point to would not like the default assumptions that are in there because they, they would need to be tweaked a bit. Um, I think for our delay model in the rail sector, we put a standard 24 or 30 hours. Um, that's what we see when we look across the dozen or so publicly available dwell time statistics. But I don't know if that applies equally well, well to Barstow as it does to a rail yard outside of Oakland. So I would want to pay attention to that. I think we should do some node specific work. Bottom line is we have a functional model that accounts for delay. Um, we ter currently calculate the labor delay, met uh, sort of a meta-analysis. We solve the route, solve the time, and then calculate an adjustment for rest. Um, we have played with the empirical data sets for speed and congestion. I haven't found a, uh, an available data set that, uh, that's perfect. So I can go through each of the steps, but the fact is the model, if we were to rerun it today, we could bring in some of these elements. Um, some of them, ARB, rightly would probably say ignore those. You're, we don't think you're doing any better than developing the capacity. And here we'd like you to put in these specific numbers. And here we'd like you to put in numbers differently for the north and the south. So we could do some of that. So from a simplistic sense, if I conclude that the knobs are there, but we need to put better data in? That's right. That would That's be, right. Okay. That's right. One of the things we've, we've worked really hard to, to, to tell everybody, and I'm glad to be able to say it again, is that we did not ever want to develop a model where we tried to put ourselves in combat with other people who were data focused. We wanted to put ourselves in a, in a situation where the model invited collaboration, allowed their data to be tested against some other default, and create that, that collaborative play environment. I guess a, a quick comment or a question. Um, so you talked about the different kinds of delay going from your choice of origin down to labor drive delays, and that's the kind of thing that your model currently has the on-off switch to be able to look at. But you also talked in terms of reliability, which is almost like the unpredictability of the delay, which seems to me to be a different factor. Um, how would you try and build that into a model across the multiple transit modes? I think I wouldn't try to make the gift model do that. Um, there are queuing models and other sorts of models. There's a really nice, um, Visio has a fairly um, easily used, I know our master's students can use it without, um, without a huge amount of stress or pain, to look at delay at various segments and have it run by time of hour up and down and do all that. You can use that sort of analysis. There's a good, one of the master's students who just finished this year did this for the Port of Savannah. And he got some nice average numbers out of it. Now, he can also give me his peaks and his valleys. But for the gift model, I would either put in the peak, put in the valley, or probably I'd put in the average. So I don't think that, that you want uh, um, every model to do every aspect of this. And that's part of why I, I, I uh, avoided trying to, to label a model for Cynthia with her question. Um, I think I'll stop there. I'd love to go on further. But you know, that's the kind of talk that we, we like having those discussions. But am I hitting the question? Yeah. I think Okay. Back here. I bet I can hear you either way. Well, I know it's just the web. I'm kind of <laughs> looking at the clock. I bet and, the web and, could hear and you And your, your way. goal to get the second presentation in 2 by 3.30. Um, I was going to make a comment um, with regard to, I guess I'll make two comments. First, I want to say, and just thinking about reliability, um, one of the things I know when I did my research many, many years ago and thinking about how important reliability is in the selection of a port for a shipment as opposed to the selection of a mode for a shipment, one of the things that actually is, is difficult with reliability is that you don't know ahead of time how reliable it's going to be. So when you make the comment about using peak or low or average, you, you can't say for a particular shipment when it's going to arrive 10 days from now how long it's going to be delayed. Right. You only know on average you know, it might be this much or it might be that much or something along those lines. So one of the things that we had thought about doing was actually just using something like an average delay um, that could be associated, or a, a, ra a randomness of delay that could be associated with different modes in order to see how that would appeal to the attractiveness of different modes. And when you have like a multinomial logit model, the person before had asked the question about possibly using multinomial logit models. Right. The measure that 
scale of variability in travel times is something that actually would impact the constant that goes into the attractiveness of a particular mode with regard in a multinomial logit model, whether you can actually well, regress to figure out what it is. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, uh, thing. is that, this is the first comment? Well, as, uh, I this was Todd's in response to the comments that Cynthia and Todd gave and all the, the whole general discussion about reliability. Okay. And then the second, the second question that I wanted to ask specifically, um, Cynthia asked about the gift model. And I know earlier during your presentation, you made some comment about transparency, one of the, one of the benefits of this gift model. I wonder if there is or if there's going to be something like a calculator or a web-based GIS tool or something that we would be able to put in an origin destination pair or perhaps adjust the specific parameters associated with a decision-making process to, to estimate this to, so it's such that we could estimate the impact of mode selection as it varies with those different variables. That's uh, so let me take that second question and uh, if I can, I'm on reserve battery now so I'm gonna, um, the guy with the black shirt took off so. Um, Oh, you are. Um, if you can tell me where to plug that in, I'll be all set. Um, the uh, that second question, I can show you um, a prototype of our web gift model, which doesn't do 500 OD pairs all at once on the web, but it allows you to start playing in that space in a web-based environment. That's something that we're developing. I think it's over the eight, next 18 or 20 months under a project to try to make it be able to work, and then to uh, and and I can talk more about that. So the answer is yes, we have a web calculator for three modes that allows you to play around with the kinds of inputs that you like or don't like and uh, give us some feedback and save vehicles that are um, named specially, et cetera. So thank you. Yes, you're terrific. Well, I can show you where it is. I don't think it works well enough to satisfy you now. No, it's, it's, a, it's a prototype in development. It's been a prototype in development for as long as since before we started this project. And we've, we've, we've pieced together what funds come in. And uh, we have a, a, small, a small team working on that now. But right now we have a, uh, a place where the team is playing around with it a little bit. And um, you can begin to see what it's looking like and maybe give us some feedback while we are still designing what we want to see in it um, and, and meeting the current funder. Um, and then the web calculator, which also I would say is in a, a version 0.0 .0 mode. It does the math right. It's not as uh, easily used as the ones that are slick and on the other websites, but we know where the numbers are and we do make them transparent. So um, you can look at that as well. Um, with regard to the, uh, the idea of, of doing probabilistic assessment, etc., cetera, um, I'm of two minds of that, which means I think I agree with you on, from two places. Um, first of all, um, I think that if you want to look at queuing and you want to look at, at how things get distributed, multinomial logits and other sorts of, of models or just stochastic models that replicate a bell curve or a, or a bimodal curve of delay or, or other parameters around that and associate that delay with idling energy or some other sort of thing, you can get a lot of the kinds of information out of um, a model like GIFT with, um, with just playing with sensitivity inputs. But what I would probably not do is necessarily couple um, logit routing algorithms yet with a model that's really designed to be more multi-user. Um, it's nice to be able to get the math right. That'd be, that'd be fun as an analytic process to solve for those coefficients, et cetera. But I think we can put them in and play around with them and see who goes, that doesn't make any sense because look what happens to me over here and that doesn't work. And then everybody else say, well, that works if you do this. So you can kind of do that. The second thing is that um, we're beginning to, to associate um, resiliency. That's the word that we're using most often. But um, the other part of that word is disaster resiliency into the model, where we can break stuff and turn stuff off and turn stuff on. We're not doing logit analyses or probabilistic assessment of what the failure is of this bridge or this location or that flooded region. But we can plant it and analyze it and see if it makes a big or a small difference. And uh, we're doing that mostly descriptively through scenario-based analysis. And there's a lot to be gained in that as you start to, to frame the kind of higher-end analytics that you would either use as a module to be brought into GIFT or probably more likely use um, GIFT to inspire for regional or other infrastructure processes. No, I'm okay. I don't know any different.
Hopefully it comes up in a minute. There we go. Should I begin? Are you ready? Okay. Um, this is going to be a shorter presentation, and it's going to mostly talk about um, maybe one or two of the elements we discussed, but only in the marine context. Um, this is uh, uh, the second of, of two very related projects, both of which nominally predated the GIFT modeling work, but inspired it. And they relate to um, uh, something that we call the STEAM network. The, uh, the most important thing you need to know about the STEAM network is Dr. Chung Fung Wong's dissertation invented the, 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 and demonstrated its, its uh, first functions. And he's here and he's yours. Um, the authorship on this report, though, is ours. Uh, the UD was UD student, uh, well, staff and, and, and all put together uh, a follow-up analysis of the work that, that uh, was delivered first by Chung Fung when he was at Delaware. Um, so I need to put my eyes on here. Um, the, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to parallel the report as closely as I can. This is more condensed and I'm going to move more quickly, I think, for a number of reasons. Um, but we tried to provide, this work provided geographically resolved and vessel specific estimates of the commercial marine traffic around North America. In the first work, we used all the different vessel types and we had um, origin destination pairs that we solved in a waterway network, but the results were provided by nation and the results were provided um, in a number of different forms, but not vessel specific. We also created forecasts from that other work that were not vessel specific. So they grew every single route at similar rates. A um, little bit of difference coast-wise, coast to coast, because we knew the growth rates were different on the West Coast than on the Great Lakes Coast, for example. Um, and then we, um, we, we put those together. We had two different growth rates that we used. Um, the, the key insights, and I, uh, I give them to you in these sort of these colored names, is that the parts of the fleets that grow the fastest show the most increase in sulfur use, um, and, uh, um, and, and they, um, they showed the, the least amount of, of reductions in a lower sulfur uh, fuel use environment scenario. The second thing is that the fastest growing portion of that was, as expected, container shipping. The third thing was that um, the, the, we have some numbers here, but the container shipping increased from being uh, about one-third of the total amount of North American shipping to about two-thirds of the North American shipping, again using some very steady state uh, nominal assumptions, not allowing for um, some of the uh, possible economic dynamics or other sorts of things that would change that just by holding those vessel-specific growth rates. And, um, and because containerized shipping is intrinsically intermodal, a la the first presentation, this is important for planning across all modes of goods movement. So um, I want to, without going into the first of the, of this, the projects that this is not, that this builds upon, I do want to talk a little bit about our baseline. Um, we had a really good foundation, and again, uh, Dr. Dr. Wong's work is, um, remains very important and highly cited. Um, in the 2002 data set that we put together, was it a 2004? When, what was the deliverable year? Minute, whatever, 2004 or so. Um, the paper was out in 2006 or seven. Seven. Um, anyway, we ended up. We started out with these sorts of numbers, and this, the thing, two things I want to make sure I make clear um, for this group is that there's a set of of uh, routes that these ships serve all the way back to other countries in serving North America. And there's also a domain, a box around North America that was important for the original analysis that was also maintained. So I'm going to try to be clear when I'm talking about what's in the North American box and what's North American shipping, but inclusive of all the 47 million metric tons is um, the global extent of the energy use from ships arriving and departing and serving North America. Um, and uh, within the domain, there was about 30 million metric tons of fuel used, and you can see the other numbers. And in the earlier work, we applied a 5.9%, almost 6% growth rate. 
This is the growth rate that was sort of um, uh, vessel specific weighted fleet wide across all that average number. Um, as most people know who study container shipping, that's a lower number. The lowest average number we saw for container shipping was around 9% per year. So we, we had used that growth rate and we grew all of the, the routes. Um, so uh, when we did the redo with that, using the same 2002 results, so this is picking up the parts of the model that um, we, we grabbed a hold of after Dr. Wong left and reusing them to the best of our ability without his um, full-time shepherding of this, we ended up coming with numbers that were very similar. Okay, they're a little bit smaller for the global and a little bit larger for the domain, but we were able to, to get that right. There's a little bit of, um, of uh, um, network and data um, differences when, when we try to pick up what we had, and we matched that pretty well. Um, so I have a number of these tables, and I'm going to definitely not show you these, um, but the main thing you want to see is categories then. I'm not going to try to talk about any number here, is that when we, when we trimmed this to the defined study domain, that was in the scope, we were then able to get, um, as you look across the row, NOx, SOx, CO2, fuel use, et cetera, and we got it for each of these different vessel types. And then we could figure out what percent of each vessel type was operating in the domain. And we could visualize that. And that was one of the important attributes geospatially to be able to visualize where these would occur. The original purpose of this was so that we could create data sets for emissions that could then be put into models to look at impacts modeling. Okay, then we did vessel specific forecasts. We created two scenarios. This was partly because the work spanned the, the beginning of the recession. And uh, ARB staff asked us to, to be skeptical about whether a 5.9% growth rate was going to continue. And uh, we weren't quite into a mode where we could figure out who was going to lose, which ports were going to shrink for a period of time, how fast they'd recover. But what we did have is some international maritime organization growth rates, which were not North American specific. They were world average. And thinking about the comparison of the continent that's leading goods movement growth, maybe arguably, um, and the world average, if we apply the world average to that continent, then we get a lower growth rate. And um, so you'll see in the scenario two, we're using an IMO growth rate, that was their high scenario growth rate. We debated a number of others, but these are the two we selected. And, um, and then we adjusted the emissions factors. These are two uh, nearly identical emissions factors tables. The top one represents the emissions factors that were in the original data set, and then, um, or for the 2002, the current day data set. And then the, we adjusted future emissions and here you see adjustments to sulfur and uh, mostly for the uh, auxiliary engines and the mains in the red circles. Those are assuming that the regulations that uh, EPA now has adopted that will lower the sulfur limits um, will, be it, uh, will be applied. Um, and so then using those growth rates, we can grow how much power would be used in the future. This is making an assumption that the energy use and the goods movement, that the work done and the energy in to do that work, sort of high school physics equation, um, is maintained. It does not make a lot of assumptions about the Maersk Tripoli e or some other sort of uh, sets of innovations that are also possible to, to, to now consider. Um, uh, we didn't make assumptions about all those mixes and matches that may also occur. So these are, these are sort of coupled growth in the energy it takes to do the job, much like you would do with a trucking fleet that still has six miles per gallon after so many decades. Um, and so then we, we um, then, as I said earlier, produced this updated 2002 inventory and showed that it largely matches the earlier one. So we know we're starting with the right numbers. And then we created an estimate for what we called the uh, business as usual growth, which was using the same vessel specific growth rates, but applying them by route specifically to those vessels. And then doing that, the same thing with the IMO growth rates for those same vessel types. And I'm not going to read the numbers. I think I don't need to. Um, the results here is that um, 
Under the 2010 scenario, we went from about 33 million metric tons to about 40 million metric tons of fuel. And in 2020, with compounding growth, you go up to almost 80 million metric tons in that second 10 years. And you can see the sulfur numbers changed as well, and we tracked all the other pollutants. Um, one graphical way to see that is to look at, and we, you know, you'll notice the knee and the curve. These are just three snapshots you could linearly interpolate between these and get more of a curve. Um, and um, that's the way somebody might do that if they were going to use these milestone data to get interannual analyses for emissions testing, uh, uh, you know, impacts analysis. But you can see that in the top um, and bottom um, column pictures there, the, the slower growth rate creates uh, less of a change in the, m the share among vessel types. But the top one, uh, the blue is containerized shipping captures a much larger market share of the future emissions overall within the, re within the, the global area and then the domain, which is, which is uh, really a parallel to the other one. Um, the only reason that they would at all be, no, that's just parallel. Um, and now this one I show you only so you can look at the patterns. The data was delivered so that you can go, somebody interested can go look at the shape files. And um, you can also um, look at them with more detail in the report. But when you look at the different patterns, um, and uh, boy, this is bad enough. I can't see which one's which. And I don't think here, I can, this one's even blurrier. Um, so let me see if I can just call out one, one, one or two of the, no, I won't get it off of here either. Anyway, the, the, um, I think the container one, oh, there we go, I can read that. So that says container. So the, the second row far left is the container shipping pattern for 2002. And um, what you can see is that different vessel types don't share all the same routes as each other. Um, and the, the motivation for this project was the observation. Actually, one of the recommendations from Chung Feng's work was by noticing that this was different and recognizing that a fast growing pattern will create more intensity of that vessel type in a future when laid on, when superimposed and added to a lower, slower growing pattern that maybe shares some of those segments. Um, uh, to replicate and make comparable with the last, with the, the original work, we also broke this out by nation. There was a multinational purpose in the first work. So the big picture here is the US. The top one, I believe, is Canada. Mexico, the top one's Mexico and the bottom one's Canada. And you can see that there's a difference in the pattern of traffic serving each of the nations. That's probably absolutely no surprise and maybe even of only modest interest to this group. But, uh, but it, it allows the comparison of these forecasts by nation with the earlier work which did not allocate vessel specific forecasts. Um, and, um, and not specifically to the current regulations for an ECA, so I put ECA-ish. Um, the implications are that in the future there's a reduction in sulfur, and that's good, but there's an increase in fuel use and CO2 emissions, and maybe some other uncontrolled emissions, and that maybe merits some, uh, some basically will continue to, to motivate a multimodal goods movement analysis. And then to, um, to go to the conclusions, there was a change in the patterns in shipping, and that change in pattern of shipping could result only from asymmetric growth rates. So while there may also be a shift from the West Coast to the East Coast because of an, an expanded canal, or there may be an emergent market for exports that, that uh, uh, exercises the Port of Oakland differently, there could be a number of other changes that would change those patterns. They would, they would come about just from the kinds of steady state growth that we saw between the 1980s and the early 2000s. We would again see another big change in just the patterns just, just from, from a very simple, simplistic assumption. Um, and because there's this change in the patterns, that can change the source of offshore emissions affecting downwind locations, some of those like California. And, um, and the other thing that was really interesting is that, you know, remember, we had this big rectangular box. But in that box, um, the ships that are serving North America spend more than two-thirds of their time, almost three-quarters of their time, 
um, specifically in that box. Um, in other words, um, um, we're, a big, we're a big area for um, traffic, even if you think of the origins being remote to us. Um, now anybody here who's studied any of the traffic congestion from long haul trucking in LA would go, yep, that's what I would have expected, that around the points of major embarkment or destination, the fraction of total time that the freight system would spend in and around that large domain of a big market would be a large fraction of the total travel time, even if some of those trucks would go all the way to Idaho or somewhere else. So um, it's not that big of a, of a surprise. The other thing is that there were some really interesting strengths and weaknesses that came from this. Um, the, um, uh, there's, um, there's really different variation in vessel specific growth and we did not break things down in this North American analysis to how bulker growth, bulk vessel growth is changing in the Great Lakes versus Texas versus the East Coast. So we don't have region and vessel specific. Um, for this work, I think it's somewhat second order in terms of evaluating that, but for California, um, you, you may want to look at whether these need to be nudged somewhat for different vessel types. Um, there are some other scenarios. Um, there's some, some good independent comparisons that are capable and we gave you shape files so you can do a lot of stuff by screwing around with your own growth rates and change those the way you want. Um, the limitations, one of the biggest limitations is that you had Dr. Chung Fung Wong and we didn't. And uh, there were a couple of uh, fixes that he was able to do in his original work that he kept track of that we weren't able to perfectly replicate. So there was a little bit of, of uh, segments um, that were ambiguously identified in terms of our, our numbering. And again, it didn't make much of a big difference as you saw in our analysis, but when we buffered and gave width to the segments, that was stuff that was essentially done by hand as part of the dissertation for Chung Fung and we didn't have enough confidence getting back to the match between those buffers and those segments. So we gave you shape files that are a lot thinner than the ones that you saw in the first report. Um, and um, there was about 4% redundant matches, things where they were double counting the same, I, same segments, two segments had the same ID and got the same emissions. And um, if you zoom into the right spots in QA, you can notice it, but it didn't have a big effect on the domain or on the results or the implications. And then uh, one of the things we learned, and, and we knew this ahead of time, but there's some locations that aren't exactly matched up. Most of that's we've noticed through some Chinese students who've looked at our origins. The ports are not exactly well located with where the docks are. Um, those things uh, we fixed by hand in the first work and we didn't change those, but there's some additional fixes in the Great Lakes and things like that that could be done. And again, get to ask for questions again, and I promise my answers will be shorter this time. Questions will be shorter too. See you, Doug. Hey, thanks, Jim. Uh, when we did the project, I think we we used the growth rate for the prior 2007. Have you done? Have you looked at the, the growth rate for? last several years are in the ballpark or now? Um, I haven't done an analysis, um, so I'll, I'll sort of give you the cocktail answer. Um, the growth rates during the recovery, which some people are still debating economically, but in terms of the cargo volumes, the year on year growth rates are crazy high right now. Um, whether there's a double dip or whether they'll flatten out. Um, I think at the end of the day, and I'm kind of going back to our first work, our goal in the first work was not to replicate volatility or transitive changes, but to look at decadal sort of growth rates. I think at the end of 2020, the growth rates that uh, we'll have seen from the time of the first work till now will probably be more similar than different. They won't be the same as what we used, but they'll be more similar than different in, in the long, long run, I think. Um, they might be higher because of, of um, other sorts of things changing. So I could, I could have fun thinking of a scenario that would make them higher. With high prices of fuel, they also might be lower. With, with voluntary speed reductions in the fleets and other sorts of things, the changes in the installed power 
Um, right now, the, the, our analysis showed that the year-on-year -year improvement in installed power and container shipping was 10% per year growth in power per every new model year on average, and about a 3% improvement in the energy efficiency of the engine and the system. So like a 7% growth in the energy used to move these ships. I think that's going to be higher between now and 2020 than what will really occur because there will be high price fuel. People will start investing in, in other ways to save money and that'll, that, that, that assumption probably won't be as high in 2020. But how that affects when you couple it with goods movement, I don't know. Good question. Fun question. Okay, any questions for Jim? No? Okay, let's thank Jim for the great presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey Jim. Jim, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks for thanks thank for coming. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> so <laughs> it was good. It was uh, it was harder to, to uh, redo the good work that uh, that Chung Fung did. Um, it was a great job. <laughs> it was easy.